everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Michael Morelli with On One, and I'm here with our guru, Scott Davenport. Scott, go ahead and say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> so Scott's going to be here, and we're very excited to have him doing our first webinar for On One Photo Raw 2018 using Beta 2. Uh, in this webinar, Scott's going to be going through some beginner, intermediate, and advanced processing techniques with the new version, and he'll take you through some of his new favorite travel and landscape photos. During the webinar, if anyone has questions, feel free to use the questions pane in the webinar screen there. I see a few of you using it right now. Hello. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, go ahead and use that pane right there, and I will go ahead and send them over to Scott. I'll answer them, and uh, we'll just have a nice, fun, interactive webinar. Scott, I'll let you take it away from there. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I want to stress again the questions part of it. That's, you know, the, that's the fun part for me, finding out what you want to hear about, what you want to learn about. And as Michael said, I'm going to go through uh, several different photos, um, starting with, you know, some basic processing to what I'll call an intermediate workflow, and then finally some of the advanced features. Uh, I'm using uh, OnRun Photo Raw 2018 Beta 2. So this is still the, the beta version that's available. Um, you can actually pick it up and try it out for yourself. But I point that out because it's still beta software, and so we may hit a bump or so along our journey, but uh, nothing that um, we won't be able to handle. And uh, so um, let's see, uh, I guess the last bit of uh, administrata is I'm going to make a point to try and pause after each photo to give time to do, uh, you know, to do questions. So Michael will be in the, the question box while we're working through things. So ask at any time, but uh, I'd like to hear a few of them, you know, uh, you know, kind of live proxied <laughs> through Michael. So, um, so let me begin here. So uh, I'm, I'm in photo raw 2018. I'm in the browse module and um, this is kind of your entry into your photo library. You've got all of your different hard drives you can access directly. You can create these things called catalog folders, which are folders that just look things up quickly. So you can have you know a variety of sets of photos. You can pop into any one of them and you'll see your previews straight away. And you have albums where you can have you know curated collections, which I will use one for today's webinar. And you can also create smart albums. So based on metadata, you know, all of your four star photos taken in the last year and things like that, you can create all of those within browse. I'm really not going to spend much time in browse at all, but I want to point out one kind of cool feature and it has to do with the processing. So um, I've got this, this photo here, or this one of these rice barrels. I like the photo. It's pretty um, straightforward. It doesn't need a lot. And I actually have access to my presets for styling the photo right within browse. And so if you get a whole bunch of categories and things that come with the software, um, I've got a bunch of preset packs. Many of these are actually made available to you as a loyalty reward. So if you're an on one user, like every month you get this like little, little gift and I can just grab one of them and then have it applied right within browse. And I haven't had to go anywhere. I didn't have to go into develop. I didn't have to go into effects. And when you've got a set of photos that either are very similar in nature and you're looking to just style you know, 10 of them, you don't have to go out of browse. You don't have to go to a different module. It's all right here. Uh, so this is the, you know, the very, very basic you know, beginner approach to styling a photo. You've got some type of preset, you apply it, you can do it right in browse, and you move on. This is all completely non-destructive. Uh, what I would consider a um, kind of a, like a, a variation on a, on a beginner approach is once you've applied something like this, going into one of the other modules and doing some slight tailoring on it. For this preset, I know that some effects filters have been applied. So I'm gonna open that panel up. And in particular, this antique filter is what's giving it this kind of, I don't know, uh, greenish type of cast. And I can just back that off a little bit because I thought that was a little bit strong for this photo. And so with a couple of clicks, real simple, straightforward processing, I head back into browse. And if I look at my grid view of my photos, you know, we can see my preview is going to be rendered like this and I'll see it like this in all and for all time. Uh, these little badges at the corner, plus and minus, they tell me I have non-destructive settings applied. And that is that is like the, the core of a, a basic, simple workflow in styling photos. 
Uh, I'm going to move on to one that's a little, little more involved, but let me pause if there are any burning questions that someone just can't wait to ask. Anything like that, Michael? <laughs> Uh, maybe mention, I guess, uh, you're, there's a lot of people asking if you're on Mac or Windows. Um, oh, okay. So the machine I'm using is is a Mac. It's an it's an iMac. Um, and uh, what is it, that 2015 vintage machine? <laughs> um, I've got a, a, a heck ton of RAM in it because usually I run about seven different programs at the same time. But uh, it's not um, it's not some souped up you know workhorse uh, with you know 97 different cores or things like that. And the files that we're looking at these are um, most of these. Whoops, wrong keystroke. Most of these are um, you know from a, either a 7R or a, a 7R2 Sony. So these this one happens to be a 36 megapixel raw file, and um, I might have one floating around here that's one of those 42 megapixel raw files. So these are pretty big files. They're not, you know, they're not 12 megapixel things. They're not JPEGs. All right, cool. Yeah, keep going, man. All right, so let's um let's go ahead and do and do this photo next. So um this is a, a shot in, in Bandon, Oregon, and I want to do something a little more than just a preset. I want to do some some basic customization, and then perhaps. Use a preset to add some style. So this, uh, I'll, I'll call this like an intermediate workflow. So I'll start off in develop, and develop will automatically detect and find lens corrections, uh, you know, lens profiles, and add all that type of stuff. And for this one, I noticed that there's still a little bit of purple and green fringing, so I can I can fine tune that, and I'm just going to crank those all, all the way up on both sides because that got pretty nasty on this particular outing there and that's taken care of the uh the fringing so i'll always start with my lens corrections the next thing i'll do is uh, deal with dust spots and this was a rainy drizzly day really windy and you can already see that there is dust all or you know water spots all over the place on the front of uh my lens the filter everything was really just getting <laughs> messy. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with me brushing away every single one of these, but I want to show you how I kind of root them out. Uh, tone and color panel has all of our basic settings, and I like to use the haze slider and pull that all the way down. You're going to start to see a lot more spots show up that we couldn't necessarily see before, and even some down here, down in the sand. Uh, there are a couple of tools that we have to correct these and retouch them away. We have the perfect eraser and we have the retouch brush. When the background is smooth like the sky is, I like to use the retouch brush. And you know, I've got my controls up here, my feather, my size, how strong I want the brush to be. In this case, I do want it to be 100%. And I'll just click on a couple of these to have them get brushed away. And you'll get the idea there. Again, I won't, <laughs> I won't bore you with this. You know, watching me brush away spots is like watching paint dry. But the eraser is their other tool. And this one's more intelligent, where it will look at your photo and the context around it. So for a spot that's down in this, you know, sand, we've got some wispy sand on either side of this spot. If I click on that one, let the eraser think about it. It'll examine the image and go, all right, what's going on behind it? I move away, I have a really nice, clean, natural looking retouch. And so I'll use a combination of both of these tools. Since we're talking about retouching, I'll just point out the final tool here. We have a clone stamp tool. And this is, you know, this is like your, uh, your copy paste, your pixel by pixel, make this really big. And I'm pressing the alt key for uh, windows or option for Mac to make a sample point. And then I get this, you know, this is what I sampled. I can place this anywhere in the scene. Of course, this doesn't make sense for this photo, but just to show you how the tool works. So I'll, I'll press just outside of the tools on that. And let's assume we've corrected all these dust spots. We'll return our haze back to normal. I double clicked on the label that will reset any of these sliders. And now I'll move into my basic settings. When I'm doing my basics, I like to have my histogram opened up because I can see that, all right, I don't have a lot of brights here. I'm going to need to do some work in, uh, in getting a good white point. 
And I'll actually start with that. I'll start with the white slider and just start moving that to the right. We'll see the brights open up. Um, if I press and hold the J key, and I'm going to push this really far. We can start to see the clipping. You see the red out there at the at the surf. So that tells me when I've I've gone too far. And I'll pull this to around here or so. Anytime I'm working a slider, I'm looking at the photo. I'm not looking at the number. The numbers don't matter. It's the look on the photo that does. Uh, let's see, the other thing I'll do next is our black point. And this one, I'm kind of just eyeballing the scene and I expect to have my darkest parts under this rock here. That looks pretty good. Do some basic contrast adjustment. So we're kind of increasing the, the delta and the distance between brights and darks. You open up our shadows just a little tiny bit so I don't lose the detail that's in this rock. And uh, let me see, I'll move on to some color things now. Uh, I'll just try the auto button for white balance. That tends to do a nice job of removing color casts. So if there's a perceived color cast, Photo Raw will figure that out and adjust temperature and tint accordingly. And I'll also just increase the vibrance a little bit. So this is kind of the basics of what we've done. I'm going to press the backslash key so we can see this is what we started with. You can see the lens corrections went away and some of our you know, different uh, adjustments are gone. And that's after. This is a, a good basic starting point. Uh, well, I want to do some style now. So I've done a custom job for t you know tailoring the settings for the raw file. Uh, I'm going to go into some style. And I'll use a, a preset to start with that. I will pause here for a minute, though, before I get into what will be the effects module, if there's other questions about develop or anything that I've done here so far. Uh, there was one person that asked uh, if you could just show again, uh, double clicking on the uh, to get the point set back to the original. Oh, sure. Yeah. So let's take uh, any slider. Let's do something really obvious like saturation. We'll put that all the way up here. If I just double click on the label right here, click, it will return to its default value. And that's true for any of the, the sliders. And it's the default value, meaning if the default is 20, well, then that's what it's going to return to. If the default is zero, like many of them are, that's where it will return. Awesome. And then also, I see a question here from uh, Shelton Thacker. Hi, Shelton. Uh, how to show the clipping? Uh, do, can you show that hotkey or explain the hotkey? Sure. Um, we'll do it in two ways. Uh, let's go up to the menus and under view, you have show clipping, which is your, your J key. So I can turn that on. And so now I, that's like, like a sticky setting, right? This little checkbox next to it. So now as I adjust, I think I was playing with the white slider. As I push that up really far, we can see the clipping. And similarly, if I take the blacks and push that all the way down, we'll see clipping in the shadows undo both of those. If you don't want to have the clipping on all the time, when you're working the slider, press and hold the J key, J as in John, and you'll start to see the clipping. And the same thing for the blacks. I'm moving the slider. I'm pressing the J key now, and I'm seeing that clipping show up. Awesome. That's all we got right now. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, said we got the basic styling here done and I want to do uh, or sorry the basic settings done I want to do some style and so um, I will often visit starting points when I don't really know what else to do uh, when you're working with presets you can either click on the name and you'll see a small thumbnail and it renders it for you uh, I actually like working with this little quick view grid mode because I get a bigger thumbnail of what I'm looking at. I can actually control that here. I'll make it really big. So I get a nice, healthy look at what I think the photo is going to do. Now, presets usually aren't perfect, right? You'll, you'll, you'll select something and most of your scene is what you want. There'll be a little tweak you need to do. And that's this one's going to be no exception. I'm going to choose night, even though this was not shot at night. That, that that's how tone and style looks good. So I've applied that preset. And if I go into the effects module now, we can see it's applied these different filters and each one of them has you know, a certain number of settings. Once, uh, once I've applied a preset, uh, I'll often just kind of run through 
each of these filters to see what it did. Um, let me close out our histogram so we have a little more screen real estate. I'll turn off the vignette. I know what that's doing. It's darkening the corners. And I'll start out by looking at the bottom and working my way up. So the tone enhancer, this is doing a bunch of stuff with highlights. And I did some things with highlights already. So I'm going to zero that out. I'm going to double click on that highlights label. So we can see before I did that, you know, the sky is getting washed out. Double click on highlights. It's bringing back in that control. Since I've already managed my highlights in develop, I don't need to double that here in effects. Moving on up, dynamic contrast, one of my all-time favorite filters. It's doing some basic things with the natural style. And for this scene, I'd actually increase the small slider a little bit. And that's for these tiny fissures in the rock, uh, this foreground rock as well, even little bits of the sand here. This filter lets you control small, medium, and large size objects. You can set what you want for the contrast for each one of those individually. And it's it's incredibly powerful. And I, I'd be hard pressed to think of a landscape photo I'm not putting dynamic contrast on. Let's see. Um, also, what else are we going to do? We're going to visit the, the color enhancer. And for, for this scene, I might actually push the blues just a little bit farther to give it a little bit of a richer feel in the sky um, before and after. So again, this, this is really what this preset's doing here, sky. It's adjusting these blue settings here. And then finally, I can go back and turn on my vignette to finish it off. So um, let's do kind of a, a, a recap of that. And uh, the easiest way for me to do that is I'm going to take the overall opacity, this slider right here. This is of everything. So you saw individual filters, you can adjust opacity. And we did that previously with the picture of the rice barrels and the antique filter. I'm going to take this all the way to zero. So this means all I'm looking at is my develop settings. And I'll bring that back to 100. And this is what we did with all these filters. So the grand sum, I do a backslash. This was what the raw file was. No adjustments in develop. No adjustments in effects. And after. And again, you'll, you'll pardon my dust. We'll consider this photo still a little bit under construction. Any other questions in there, Michael? There are quite a few. So if you have some okay. question, I'm trying to get to them as uh, best as I can. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything um, specific to what's going on right now. Okay. Uh, why don't you just keep on going here? I'll keep answering questions. And if uh, anything does jump out, I'll, uh, I'll interrupt you here and jump in. All right. Um, I actually thought of one other thing for this photo that um, it's a it's a feature of the vignette filter that I, I didn't show off here. Um, I, I like the vignette for this photo, but this is a cool feature. So I want to point it out is this little crosshairs tool. So um, what we can do with this is set the center of the vignette. So to make this very uh, visible, I'm going to take the feather and bring it all the way down to zero and the brightness all the way down to zero. So you can see this is the edge of the, the vignette. I said feather to zero. There we go. This is the edge of the vignette. With this crosshairs, I'm clicking and dragging and I can set where I want that to be. So I can bias my viewer's eye towards say this rock down here in the foreground. And then once I've done that, I can return the feather to, you know, whatever makes the most sense as well as the brightness. And I'll use that feature quite a bit because it's, um, Usually when we're composing our photos, we're doing things like rules of thirds or, you know, uh, or, you know, putting putting our, our main subject not dead center. So having the vignette crosshair centering point is incredibly useful. All right, let's um, let's go back into browse then we'll move on to another photo. Press the G key for my grid view. And uh, one thing I've gotten to in the past oh, six to eight months is doing panorama photos. And so I want to show off one of the new features of PhotoRaw 2018. So I'm holding down the command or control key for a PC 
to select all of these photos. And in the right hand side, we now have a merge to Pano. There's also a merge to HDR. Um, I won't be showing HDR today. It's just not a big part of my photography, but you do have HDR merging capability. I'm gonna click on the Pano button. And one of the things I wanna point out is how quickly we get a preview in front of us. You know, it takes maybe four to five seconds. And now I have an idea. Is this going to be uh, a problematic panorama or not? You know, do I see any obvious points where the stitching looks strange? And uh, for this one, it looks, uh, looks pretty good. Uh, for the panorama itself, we have a few different options. We can do nothing with the edges. So you end up with, you know, usually a little bit of wobble around the edges. You can have it crop for getting rid of any of that black space that was around there. There's also a warp to fill option. For this photo, I actually like crop. The warp is, is shifting the perspective a little bit and I'm kind of watching you know, this particular post, which I know should be straight and vertical. Uh, we have a few other options. You can, once we click save, you can have the pano go right back to browse. You can have it open directly in developer effects. And if you're sharing this on sites like Facebook, you can add in this panoramic metadata. So in your Facebook feed, you can click and drag around the photo and it's kind of like you're standing in the middle of it and get to look around in 3D. Now the merging uh, will still take time. And I've got, you know, 40-ish megapixel photos, seven of them. So I'm not going to have the merge happen here live, but at the end of it, we end up with a photo like this. I'm going to let the preview regenerate. There we go. And so we get, you know, a, uh, a nice merged pano. And I've done some development work on this. As a matter of fact, why don't we, this will, let me show off another feature, uh, which is the versions. I'm going to create a version of this photo. And what this does is it makes a, it's like a, it's a soft copy. It's not duplicating the entire photo. It's just creating another reference to my original photo. And it lets me change all the settings. So I can pick that and I'm going to go into settings, reset everything. And now I can bring that into develop and do some work on it. Now this will take a little bit to load because it's a uh, uh, hundred some odd megabytes worth of pixels, actually more like a, let's see, does it even tell me? No, it's, it's too big. This actually might be larger than two gig. <laughs> so uh, we'll work with, uh, we'll work what we have here, but um, what, what can I do with this? So I can do my, my basic tuning like we did before, you know, my tone and color settings and it's a gray day. I've got some hot spots on the roof. So I'll probably pull down the highlights a little bit and uh, deepen the shadows. So I'm kind of watching for uh, for the shadows underneath the, the building and the railings there. Uh, what else will we do? Maybe, maybe add a little bit of warmth. Let me try the, the auto setting because a lot of times that gives me a pretty good adjustment on color cast. Oh, that's pretty all right. I'm going to keep that. And uh, let's see, what else would I want to do here? I mentioned dynamic contrast. That's always one of my favorites. Let's go over into effects. And so this is an example of building up kind of your filter stack from scratch. So instead of using a preset, I'm going to just add a few filters on my own. I'll add dynamic contrast. And uh, I kind of like what it's doing to the, the trees. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit much on the, on the ground and the gravel for me you know, before and after. So uh, what we do have is lots of masking tools and we can do masking on any filter in effects. And one of the masks we have is called a gradient mask. It's a masking bug. You've got a variety of presets and shapes and so forth. I'm going to take, uh, just drop one on the scene and we can tell that it's removed the contrast above and it's left the contrast beneath. It's kind of the opposite of what I want. So I'll rotate that around and kind of just position it where I think it makes sense. And finally, I can tailor the strength or the opacity of that. So I'm going to put it around half. And so what that's doing is we're removing some, but not all of the contrast beneath the, uh, the gravel there. So this is before the 
contrast ad. This is after. And so this is by far most prominent. This is getting a little bit of a detail and contrast boost, but it's, um, it's not taking my eyes away from what the overall scene is. Uh, I think maybe one other thing I would do too here is probably just increase some of the, the greens. So we'll add a color enhancer. And one of the styles is foliage. You take a guess that that's going to make the greens very bright. That's probably too much. So I have a couple of options here. I can play with saturation of the greens and tone that down, um, or I can just adjust the entire strength of the filter. And this is usually what I'll turn to first, the overall strength, because it's one slider. There may be many things set in, in all these different color ranges. In fact, I know for foliage, we're actually changing yellows too. That's really what makes the greens pop. You're shifting yellow toward green. So I'll just use the overall strength there. And so that's um, that's a, a pretty uh, basic, or I would call it intermediate setup for adding your own sets of filters where if you know you just need a little bit more, you need a little bit of contrast or a little bit of color, you might just want to add those filters directly yourself. Of course, if you like them, you can create your own preset. You can take your settings and you can save those as a preset for yourself. So Scott, to jump in real fast, while you're up there, um, a few customers are asking about, um, I believe you might have your set in solo mode by chance under the view options. Yes, I do, so, uh, right uh, here. The differences of that real quick to, that I think a lot of sure. people like what they're seeing there. Okay, so what solo mode means is only one panel in the right hand side will be open at any time. So if I click on dynamic contrast, that will open up and color enhancer will close. And look, just for, for demonstration purposes, let's add a few more crazy amounts of filters here. This is gonna be like the worst looking photo ever, but to prove a point, anytime I click on one of these solo modes, it's just open what I've clicked on and collapse everything else. Versus, I guess, I don't know what the opposite of solo is. <laughs> Group mode, <laughs> non solo. Boy, that's good. Yeah, anyway, this is what happens when you don't have solo set. You get all of these things open. Um, I prefer solo mode because I'll end up scrolling a lot less between my different filters. And it, granted, I'll, I'll, there, there are photos where I'll have seven or eight filters here um, where you know, yeah, I might open that bottom one and still have to do a tiny bit of scrolling. But that's what solo mode is all about. So, you know, one filter or uh, it, same thing works for local adjustments. If you've got multiple local adjustments here, the same thing in develop. If we were to go into develop and let's, let's add a color adjustment, or let's add a split tone and let's add a vignette. The same idea. I only get one panel at a time. All right, I need to get this photo off my screen because it's kind of creeping me out a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Just need to move on. It's a little bit spooky. So uh, I'm going to return to browse, and um, the uh, the 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 last photo that um, I'm going to go through today, um, and I'm glad I've got the time for is because this is the one that's really going to be like the advanced processing, the other the custom from the ground up. We're going to process this photo and. As I did before, I'm going to create a new version. And I'm going to select that version. So you can tell it's a version by this you know, black and white square there. And you highlight it, it says version photo. The settings, I'll reset the develop settings. And I'll reset the effects. And I'll reset the local adjustments. So the only thing that I'm leaving here as I go into develop is any retouches that I've done. So I've done that spot removal that we saw before. And I did a little bit of cropping really to straighten the horizon. So, you know, so this is the raw photo that we're going to work with. And uh, for full on maximum screen real estate, we'll make this nice and big collapsing down that uh, presets panel. And I'll begin in tone and color. This is really where I start all of my processing. And we'll open up my uh, levels here so I can see what my histogram's looking like. So this is, uh, to me, it's slightly overexposed. I've got some 
some cramping and crushing here at the right edge. Now the sun's going to be blown out. I'm shooting into the sun. That's just how it's going to be. You know, you, your your eye looks at the sun. You're not seeing detail, and so we're just we're just not going to have anything there for that. But I will bring back the exposure some, just to uh, to kind of get some of that hints of those clouds coming back through there. While we're thinking about highlights, let me tone the highlights down just a little bit too. And again, I'm just watching the photo. I'm not really uh, paying attention to where the numbers land. I'm going to open up the shadows quite a bit. Maybe, maybe around there. Um, you know, a slider that I'm probably not going to use, but I'll point out is the midtone slider. You know, that that's that's something new in in Photo Raw 2018. Um, I'm not going to use it for this photo because I have pretty good distribution of, of, of darks to lights in this one. Uh, but I, let's see what I'll do here. I'm, I'm going to start playing with the white slider too, and still still see about about pulling back on you know this this bright hot spot here around there or so. Uh, now, well, I, I know I'm jumping around a little bit between sliders, but uh, my I, I guess my approach to the processing is usually like, you know, what does the photo need next? Or what am I thinking about right now? And how can I uh, address it is, um, is some of the highlights here. When we take down like highlights really far, we take down whites really far, we get this kind of artificial looking, you know, almost yellow tinged uh, coloring in the highlights. We undo those two changes. And I don't want to have that happen. Uh, and so a slider that really helps with that is highlight purity. And you can even see it's a like yellow tinted on the left and it goes over to pure white. And I'll just usually inch that up a few notches just to compensate for that and keep the really bright highlights nice and smooth. Return to color temperature. Let's just hit auto, see what that's going to give us here. And um, I'm going to turn that back into Kelvin. I still think in terms of degrees Kelvin as opposed to uh, just a uh, a scaled slider from say negative 100 to 100. I do want this to be a little warmer. So I'm just got inching up the warmth here. Maybe about there looks pretty good. All right, so you know we're we're just getting started. There's still you know this is uh, before any of those changes. You can see the little rotation I did to to fix the the crop and align the horizon. And that's after. So it's, it's starting to take shape. This is still very flat, but we're just getting started. All right. For screen real estate, let me cl close down levels. I'm going to take care of some global color adjustments here. And I'm going to use this desert style. Now, what desert does is it increases reds and oranges. So we can see before. And these rocks are kind of dull. They actually do have, you know, they're a sandstone type color. There's an orange tinge to them. And that's after. So it's starting to pick up some of that nice sunlight that's going on there. A, uh, a question I get asked reasonably often is, you know, when do I use the color adjustment in develop versus the color enhancer in effects? And um, for the most part, the answer is if I know I'm only going to be doing color uh, additions selectively, I'm going to mask it into a certain area. I'll use effects. The controls are the same, uh, but effects, I have the masking tools and I have blending modes. I have more control over exactly where in my scene that color is going to be applied. Uh, when I know the color is just going to be an adjustment globally, I'll do it right here in develop. All right, I'm going to jump into effects next. Um, before I do, Michael, I'm going to pause for questions again. Yeah, actually, there's a couple people asking if you wanted to level this. Not that this photo isn't level, but a lot of people, I think, struggle with having, you know, level landscape horizons. So if you were going to level this photo, what exactly would you do right now? Sure. Well, let's do this because I actually did have to level this photo. So I'm going to reset the crop. Okay. And you'll see a little bit tilted, right? I did an okay job, but I didn't do a perfect job in the field. So with the crop tool, open that up, and there is a level right here that I'll use this. So I'll click on this level, and now you can see the, the cursor's got this little level thing next to the arrow. And I'll pick one spot on the horizon, let's say right there, and I'll draw a line. 
That doesn't have to be all the way across. You know, to about there, let go. And that's mostly leveled things. The second part I'll do is then I'll move the cursor just outside the crop window. And you can see now it's turned into this circular rotation icon. And now when I click and drag up and down, I can fine tune it. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the horizon. And it's roughly you know, cutting that, that row of squares right in half. And I'm just making sure that on the left edge and the right edge, they're almost about the same. So I'm going to end up right around there or so. And now it looks like it's a little bit, little bit off, Oop, wrong way. So something like that. So just, you know, this is, this is, uh, they'll use a little bit of tweak here, but that's the process that I'd use. Perfect. Oh, and then of course hit apply. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to apply it yeah so i think you're good to uh keep going on and just a reminder to everyone there is the questions pane over uh in the webinar control panel so if you do have any questions you'd like to ask of squat of scott feel free to send them on in and uh, we can get them asked here in just a few moments great all right okay so let's um let's get some style going on this photo move over into the effects module and I'm gonna build this from the ground up. Uh, familiarity with the filters just comes with practice and time. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no magic there. It's just getting, getting to know what your style is and what you like to use. I know I like dynamic contrast, so I'm gonna add this first. Now, overall, this is just too much for this photo, in my opinion, right? Before and after. It's making a lot of things very crisp. What I want, crisp are the rocks. I want the additional detail in there. I want those fissures to show up. And so I'm going to start adjusting the sliders, but I'm only really paying attention to the rocks. I'm going to tailor the filter shortly after adjusting these sliders to only affect the rocks. So something like that looks pretty good for these foreground and midground rocks. So um, advanced feature like number one we'll talk about are the blending options. So in the gear menu, we have blending options where we can change the mode, but more importantly, we can apply to different tonal regions. And so as I hover over these, you're gonna see the photo change a lot. Shadows is exactly what I want to use because the rocks are my shadow tones. So this was everything. This is shadows only. I haven't done any masking. I haven't had to paint anything in or out. I just get my, my shadow slider. And then I can adjust the range to tell the filter, consider you know, more things shadows or less things shadows. So as I start to push this farther and farther, you'll see the photo starts to get more and more contrasty. And the converse, you know, if I go all the way down to these low numbers, no, the rocks all still look soft. So the default was around 40 or so. Um, and again, I'm just watching the photo at this point. So around here looks pretty good. So all that added together, we, we added some contrast, adjusted the sliders, watching the rocks to make sure they look good, and then tailored it to apply to only the shadow areas. And so before and after, getting a little bit of crispness under that wave, and the rocks are starting to stand out. So blending options inside the gear menu, um, incredibly useful and can save you quite a bit of painting and masking. Okay, um, next filter, I'm going to add some sunshine. So the sunshine filter is a really nice filter because, well, uh, especially for scenes that has sunshine in it, it really is a nice amplifier and it can give a nice softer, warmer glow. Uh, now this is, um, this is ending up blowing out the sky a little bit and we're going to deal with that soon. But the, the first thing we'll do is add some more warmth with the sunshine slider. So kind of saying, you know, I, I, I want this to have more of that afternoon, late evening type of glow. And uh, let me play with saturation here a little bit. Looks pretty good. Now to deal with the brightness up here, uh, second advanced feature, we're gonna do some masking. So I'm gonna open up the mask icon and this is giving me all sorts of different options. One of them is a luminosity mask. I'm going to click luminosity mask and we're going to see the photo change and notice the mask here in the small preview window. As a matter of fact, 
let's make sure I have my view mode set to grayscale. I'll show the mask. So right now we're looking at a mask, the luminosity mask. It reads the tones of your photo. And for dark shadowy areas, it creates a very dark or black mask hiding whatever it is we're applying, in this case, sunshine. And the brighter parts of your image end up being a white mask revealing what is in the scene. So I'll turn off the mask view. So we'll button down here. Now I wanted to protect these highlights and prevent them from getting too blown out. Well, I can also invert masks. So I'm going to invert it. And now I've got, you know, a bit of a, a dreamier feeling going on here in the in the foreground. I haven't made the, the background get too soft or blown out. And I'm doing masking, but I'm doing it in a very simple way. I'm clicking a couple of buttons and again, thinking visually. And if I press, uh, I can press the O key, which is the same as this little icon down here. O key to show the view. You know, this looks almost like a, you know, infrared <laughs> type of, you know, photo negative really. Uh, but thinking about, you know, well, where do I want this sunshine applied, right? White masks reveal black masks conceal. So I'm hiding most of the effect from the sky. And that dance of applying a luminosity mask and inverting it to target something to your shadowy areas, um, a very common technique that, that I'll use all the time. All right. Let me pause there, Michael. Something, some little icon popped up on my screen then disappears. I don't know if that was something from the 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 questions panel but um i i, I don't see it in front of me and i um, i don't want to dive off the screen and <laughs> lose the photo here yeah yeah sorry about that a few uh people were asking if you could just show off the uh before and after again there um just as you're the sunshine yeah, sure exactly so that's before and that's after and you know, why don't we go through the the entire thing here, right? So let's let's reset the mask, turn off the sunshine filter, right? So we added the sunshine filter. Looks pretty good, a little bit blown out in the sky. I create a luminosity mask, and then I inverted it. And so the end result, before and after. All right. Um, Let's move on. Um, the next thing that I'm thinking about as I look at the photo, um, the, you know, the, the the color palette's very soft. It's like almost almost a pastel feeling to it, and and I like that. I'm just going to kind of you know go with that and work with it. Uh, I don't want to make it oversaturated, so I'll add a color enhancer. And uh, for this is a case where I'm I'm adding the color globally, but you know, why am I not going back to develop? Well, I'm already here. And I, I may as well just work where I am as opposed to bouncing through modules. So uh, the first thing I'll start with is the sky style. Now, so I want to get some blues going on up in that sky there. But um, it also is adding a bit of blue into the surf, which I want to, uh, to kind of keep managed. So I will start visiting the sliders. Now, the sky style adjusts the blue channel and the aqua channel. And you know, if you're not sure which ones are being affected, you're just gonna run through them really quickly. And we can see that it's aqua, blue, and that's all that this is adjusting. So in the aqua channel, um, what I think I'll do is I may take the brightness back to nominal. Again, double clicked on that to adjust it. And in the blues, actually bias those a little more toward aqua so it's kind of giving more of a more of that pastel feeling to uh to those richer blue tones so let's see before and after and that is quite a subtle change it's really only affecting this area of the photo um for folks that have are familiar with my work you know i'm kind of like a add several small subtle changes together and it adds up to something uh nice at the end so this is one of those where it's really only this this particular area um and so I think I still want to do some more work with color. Um, but what I'll do is I'll do that with a second color enhancer. We can add the same filter multiple times. So I'll add a second color enhancer. Now this one down here is what we just did with the blues. And this one up here, 
um, I think I just want to have the oranges get a little bit uh, a little bit richer. So instead of using one of the styles, I just want to work with oranges. I'll go right to that color range and uh, just increase the saturation a little bit. Um, oranges and reds are quite sensitive to uh, saturation. So, you know, if I push it too far, you know, this suddenly just looks um, almost uh, thermonuclear. So when you're working with, with saturation for reds and oranges, be, be gentle on the, on the slider. And I might open up the brightness a little bit. I mentioned this, this area is going to be blown out. I'm going to work with that and, and go with it. I'm, I'm not going to try to fight uh, against nature when it comes to shooting directly into the sun. All right. Um, I'm feeling I'm kind of done with color. Um, I'll pause again, Michael, if there's anything that uh, I need to repeat or, uh, or questions that are in the queue. You know, I do have a few questions for you, but uh, why don't you keep going through this edit here? Uh, most of these questions are a little bit more about sharpening and detail, so I'll let you keep finishing up your color enhancements here before we get into that. Okay. Um, I'm thinking I'm, 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 I'm close to done, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go on to um, adding a, a little bit of a glow. Now, I added the sunshine filter before. That adds some glow. Um, this is um, – I'll, I'll add glow to, to photos, um, to landscapes, even though it's not, it's not realistic per se, but it's more conveying a feeling. So um, first, I'll just start working the amount slider, and I'm kind of just watching the scene overall. You know, I'm, I'm not particularly – happy with with what it's doing to the rocks i'm more watching the surf and uh and the sky so it's getting it you know a little softer feel and i'm going to push that pretty far but we are going to change this a little bit play with halo and that's that's going to kind of give it that you know soft almost angelic type glow well, and ship that there a little bit and the mode, um, I'll just run over these with the mouse. I'm just mousing over them. I'm not having to click, and it's just giving me the previews straight away. Um, I think I, I do just like soft light. That seems to be the nicest one. Now, what I need to do is I need to protect the rocks and you know and some of the foreground here. Uh, now we, we did that before using some of our protection sliders. But I want to show you another mechanism, and this is uh, one of the newer features. Now, the new, in my opinion, the, the best new feature of Photo Raw, and it has to do with luminosity masks. So I'm going to add a luminosity mask, and we saw this before, right? We add the luminosity mask, and it creates that black and white version of the photo. I'm going to turn that on, and we have some new controls, levels, and window where we can fine tune what this luminosity mask is going to affect. So I said, I want to protect the rocks. And so what that means is I want the rocks to have as dark a mask as possible so that, whoops, wrong, wrong button. So this glow is not applied here, right? So once again, masking, I'm going to have a black mask to hide those areas. So I can start adjusting these sliders here. Now what window does, you see it runs from all the way dark to all the way bright, you're kind of saying, well, what what areas do I need to focus in on? And as, as I increase this window, you can see that that foreground's getting very, very dark, right? Um, you can go even even like right around, right around there or so. So anywhere that has a black mask is no longer receiving the glow, right? And I can also do the same thing with the highlights. And you'll notice the brightest brights are now getting a black mask. So I'm not even adding any glow into those super bright areas because that, that, that's already bright. It's already got, uh, you know, um, kind of a, a diffused look to it already. And so now this is only manipulating the, the mask. I'm going to turn off the, the mask. You know, our photo still looks pretty normal. But now here's the difference in the glow before and after. We're really seeing it up and out here. We're not seeing it down here in the rocks. And um, I think that's really about uh, about what I would do with, with this particular one. Perhaps, press the O key again, um, maybe backing off that window just a little bit so I catch a little more glow up in there. It was starting to creep in on that corner. Press the O key one more time to turn off our mask overlay. And that's before and after. This is a little too bright now. So I will now go into those blending options. 
something I didn't show you. We had the apply to where you could select tonal regions. We can also protect different tones. And so I can protect the highlights. And as I raise that up, I'll push it all the way. You can see that the glow is getting reduced on the top there. So I'll just watch that particular region of the photo until I end up with a, with a value that, that looks pretty good. Right around there looks pretty nice. So all of that summed up, we did some, some uh, luminosity masking and tailored it with the window slider here that took away the glow from this foreground area. And then in the blending options, I did some further protection to protect this area. And so we end up with before and after. So a nice, nice glow, a nice little, you know, dreamier feeling out here in the distance. Uh, what's, uh, uh, is there a question, Michael? Yeah, I was going to jump in here. Um, we have actually a few people asking about the range slider. And I think it was back on the last filter you added for color enhancer. Um, I see there is that, that color range slider there in glow, but there's the uh, range slider right there. Yeah. That if you okay. were asking if you could just explain what that does, you know, what exactly does this do on each color chain? Okay, so um, it's it's kind of saying, well, what do we want to consider a yellow or an orange or so forth? So um, if I start pushing this farther and farther, more things that resemble orange will start to get affected by the settings that I've chosen. Conversely, you know, less things that are considered orange. Um, the the you know the tool help kind of says increase or decrease the global contrast. Um, that's probably not the most helpful tool help that there there is. Uh, but though I, I have to honestly say, I I don't think I ever use the range slider. I usually just leave it right where it is. And um, if I need to do any anything that I have to tone back certain areas, I tend to use masking like we just saw with the luminosity masks, where you know it's more I'm more usually more interested in toning down. Uh, the darker areas or amplifying lighter areas or vice versa. But um, if I would push this saturation really far, let's see if we can see if I start making range more, it's starting to creep in a little bit more into the sky. And I don't know how much um, video compression is, is fighting me right now, as far as, you know, what, uh, what you guys are actually seeing on the screen. Um, but yeah, you can this see range it a little bit. It's, is a little bit here. Yeah, it's 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 not it's, it's pretty subtle. You know, all the way down to zero, we're seeing a little bit less orange here. All the way up, it's a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of just saying, what do I consider an orange? Awesome. So to jump then to uh, another question that, that mm -hmm. back, like I was talking about earlier about the uh, sharpening and dynamic contrast. There's a lot of people asking, you know, what's the difference between dynamic contrast? What's what's the difference between that and sharpening in effects, doing detail and develop? You know, what what does Scott Davenport do? Does he prefer to sharpen in effects? Does he prefer to do detail and develop? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's actually how I would answer this. I mean, for me to to delineate the differences between them. I don't know the algorithms on how they work, but how, how I operate is when you enter in, you introduce new, uh, or you introduce local contrast, that's going to amplify uh, the illusion of sharpening, right? So um, let's, let's go ahead and just do a little, little sidebar on this. So if I, I take dynamic contrast in here and I start, I start really, you know, pumping things up and this local contrast in particular, you know, this starts to look very crunchy, very sharp. Right. Um, forget about the, the messiness here, but just kind of looking at the rocks. Um, so the um, what I do is I use dynamic contrast to get my uh, my, my sharpness looking good. The only uh, times I'll use sharpening, per se, is when I'm going to print something. And that really ends up being dictated by, well, where am I having the, the printing done? Um, if I'm doing it myself, I'll probably just be doing a little bit of output sharpening um, when I export the photo. Um, or if I'm printing directly from on one, I'll do a little bit of uh, you know sharpening before I print it. If you're sending it to a print house, it's kind of really what do they want? You know, sometimes they, they say, don't worry about it. We'll take care of the sharpening. Um, but for since most of my work is consumed online through screens, um, I don't I don't really 
use sharpening very much at all. I, I do my work with contrast. Awesome. And another question to add here for you, is there a highlight purity slider that you use to protect your highlights? The one spot I will use that is in develop. And that was in tone and color. And we actually did use it on this photo, just a very slight bit. So I'll usually do that very early on. And of course, if I needed to come back and revisit it, like for this one, if I if I start increasing, you see those highlights out in that that sunspot there start to get really, really bright. But uh, this is the this is the area I'll normally do it. Um, you'll find in some I don't think I don't think dynamic contrast had it. Tone enhancer might have it. I'll check really quickly here. No, it doesn't. Okay. Sometimes you find sliders that are in filters that are also in develop and think of them as just convenience, right? They'll, they'll, they'll fundamentally do the same thing. And if you don't have to bounce back to a different module or another filter and the sliders right there, you know, go ahead and use it. But specific to that question, tone and color, these purity sliders right here for highlights or for shadows. Perfect. Perfect. And then also there is a question on presets and mm -hmm. um, whether you use develop presets or effects presets and what the differences of those are. Sure. Um, so generally I will use effects presets. Um, most of the work I'm doing is kind of photos like this where I'm going to need to do the basic adjustments in tone and color by hand. Um, more, more often than not, uh, I haven't found a preset that, that uh, gets it done exactly how I'd like it in develop. And I've become so you know, familiar with all these sliders, it's almost like autopilot for, for many of them as I'm processing it. And then when I apply something, I'll use um, uh, a... Um, a preset that just has effects filters in it. Um, I don't know of a way that you can tell by looking at the preset what it has in it other than applying it. So um, when you, I will say when you're creating your own presets, like when you go, like if I were to try to save this as a preset, we've done work in develop and effect and we have some gradients. You can choose what you wanna save. So you can just say, I just want develop settings, or I just want, in my case, you know, effect settings. And if there's masks that I've used, I can save those. And you can create your own presets with just effects. Perfect. Yeah. And I think there, there, there's probably a, um, a preset or two I've created that, that use develop, but I tend to just use the auto settings and you know, let the tool do its best job because it fundamentally is you know, telling the preset, go interpret the photo uh, how you think it should be done on one and uh, you know, I'll go tweak it afterward. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So I think I have uh, maybe a curveball here for you in the spirit of All right. Baseball World Series starting today. Can you explain <laughs> structure versus dynamic contrast and how do you choose which one you would use? All right. Um, I'm going to go even a little bit deeper on that one, if that's okay. <laughs> go for um, it. But let's start. Let's start with structure. So, for example, this photo we've already applied dynamic contrast and we targeted the rocks. Let's take a look at what structure is going to do. I'm going to start pushing that up. Notice that inside the rock, you're starting to see more of those individual tiny fissures and details and so forth, um, where we don't have it. We've got it there now. It's a much um, you know, crunchier, grittier look. And it's really amplifying contrast like inside of objects where dynamic contrast, I go over to that filter and I'll push, I'll push like the small slider. We'll start to see some of that show up, but it's, um, it's not as hard. It's not as, uh, as forced. If I, if I really start pushing all these sliders, You'll start to see it all there, but you notice there's still a different, a different um, like you know gradation of that um, of those contrasts. It's um I guess I would say dynamic contrast is I'm gonna undo those changes is a little more um, natural in its approach, and structure is more um, across the board. One way I'd like to explain that is with the tone enhancer, because this was kind of like the 
the precursor to dynamic contrast if we go back you know several iterations of of on one photo the difference between detail and clarity now once i push detail slider you're going to see you know a bunch of things get pronounced around edges and then if i push clarity i'm sorry the other way around detail is, is the insides of on objects and clarity is kind of like the edges of things so um structure is a lot a uh, lot more similar to what what detail is doing in the um in the tone enhancer filter it's dealing with uh the micro contrast inside of objects um to pick on this rock this poor little rock i keep picking on these you know this this dark channel here this dark line here this dark line here um I go back to structure, it's going to kind of do everything inside of all that. Where's my structure slider? There it is, right? So everything and anything in between. Whereas some of the other contrast controls, the uh, the clarity slider and tone enhancer or dynamic contrast, will kind of more amplify these larger fissures. And then you'd really need to, you know, either use the smalls and dynamic contrast or, you know, turn to structure. Or um, if I wanted to be selective about it, I would use the detail slider and tone enhancer and paint in here to get in between these, uh, these larger features of, uh, of contrast. In this case, it's a rock. Gosh, I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a good job. I think everyone appreciates that. <laughs> So uh, we are coming down the home stretch here. So if anyone has any last questions they'd like to ask, feel free to send them on in. This webinar is being recorded. We will post it on our website. Um, other than that, uh, Scott, it looks like everyone's pretty much good on questions here from what I'm seeing. So if you have any final parting thoughts you'd like to leave with us here. Um, other than thanks everyone again for taking the time, some really good questions. And um, yeah, sorry I didn't get to finish off this photo entirely, but that's okay. It looks pretty nice as it is. Probably add a vignette, and that would be a you know probably call it good. But uh, yeah, if um, there are other questions, you know, you can get a hold of on one through their website. You can get a hold of me if this goes you know up on the you know, on the Facebooks and the YouTubes and the on one dot coms of the world. You know, ask questions there. We'll be sure to get you some answers. Yep, and to add to that, I will be posting it to all those places, the blog, our Facebook, the On One YouTube. So if uh, you see this webinar and have a question, feel free to add anything to the comments. Feel free to send in an email to On One directly, just uh, cs at onone.com. And uh, otherwise, Scott, thank you so much for being here today for the kickoff 2018 webinar. And uh, everyone else, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, have a good one, everyone.